Microsoft, the SDL thing. That project, the Microsoft Trustworthy Computing Initiative, is a decade old now. So why don't we just go and study the people that have been doing it and describe what we see? We'll call it science. So we want to transition faith-based software security into observation-based software security. Everybody see that move? And that's what this model is all about. Now there's a logo for the model which is this bulldozer and you can decide for yourself what it's pushing around. But it's brown, I'll tell you that. Pushing around some brown stuff. Uh, and this is a model, this is some work that I did jointly with uh, Brian Chess who is the chief scientist and co-founder of Fortify and uh, Sammy Miguez who is a principal at Sigital. And uh, we all three worked equally on this stuff. So the, so the thing that I happen to know when I've been collecting for, for a few years is that there are a whole bunch of large-scale software security initiatives. By large-scale, I do not mean they have a guy who does code review on staff. Or, oh, yeah, yeah, that's like, you know, some guy down in the IT world every once in a while pops up and does a review of a, of a system. Large-scale software security initiative means all the developers are using the same SDLC, they're using some best practices, they're tooling things up and automating things as much as possible, and in fact, there's a view from the executive management into what's going on in software security because it's that important to the corporation. Now, I'm aware of 46 programs like that. There's even more now, but this is a list of 46 um, that fits on a slide. And you can divide these companies into verticals. So you see that 26 of them are financial services companies, seven are ISVs, that means independent software vendors, six are just general technology companies, a couple defense, three retail, one oil, and one we're not sure what they do because they do everything. That's GE. I'm not really sure what they do. So, so, uh, so the, the thing is, since these guys have been doing it for a while, why don't we choose who we think is doing a good job and study them? And so, you know, you can argue what a good job might mean and how we might argue that or how we might pick that. Here's how I did it. I just picked the ones that I thought were the best and I called them up and I said, guys, we're going to do a science experiment. We're going to come and talk to you about what you're doing in software security and we're going to gather data. And then we're going to figure out what to do once we gathered the data. Are you in? And everybody I called said, yeah, we're in. And here are uh, some of the companies that were involved. There are two that, that we can't name that are financial services firms, but some of these other firms you do know. Uh, and you know those two financial services firms too. They're sort of everyday household names. But uh, Microsoft and Google in the same study, and the world didn't end. Uh, Adobe and Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm makes cell phone guts. Wells Fargo, just a small little bank. Uh, EMC, just a, another tiny little software company of a few billion. And uh, then DTCC, which, which is always the mystery. Does anybody know what DTCC does? They clear all of the transactions on Wall Street um, every day. And it, each year they do $1.8 quadrillion dollars worth of transactions, which is uh, 15 zeros. It's a whole lot of zeros. So you might imagine that software security is important to them. In fact, software security is important to all of these companies. And so here was the methodology that we, uh, that we followed. We picked these nine, we called them up, and we said, see there used to be 35, nine of, nine of 46, and, and we called them up and we said, um, we want to talk to you about what you do around software security. And we're going to use something that we call the software security framework to, to guide our conversation. You can think of the software security framework, which I'll show you in the next slide, as kind of a grid in archaeology. You know when you're doing archaeology, you, you take the thing and you, you, you stick like a tent peg in the ground and you draw some string and you make squares and then you start digging and wherever you find something interesting well you write down what square you found it in. So you know where you found these things. Well that's what the software security framework is supposed to be for us. We did nine in-person interviews that were a couple of hours each. Now there was the advantage that I knew all these nine guys for um, at least a decade so, so the conversations were very straightforward in fact, the thing that was the coolest to me about this work was how incredibly forthcoming everybody was. Because one of the problems in computer security is people are remiss to share. They're remiss to share 
their problems. They're remiss to share what they're doing and how they're managing their risks because they're afraid it might not be right. Um, but if there's an opportunity to do it in a trusted way, in a way where everybody gets to share the data and they can learn from each other, it turns out to be possible. This is something that I know that you guys have done at Sirius um, for, for years. And that's a, it's a great insight and a very important insight. So everybody agreed to do it. And we went and gathered data. And we had an open-ended conversation. Now I'm going to show you the model that we developed out of these data throughout the course of this talk. But here's what I want you to understand. We did not go and say, so how do you do training on introductory software security for all the developers? And do you do it when they start? <laughs> That's not the way this interview thing went. Instead, it would be, gosh, you guys have 30,000 developers? <laughs> how in the heck do you teach those guys? What do they know about software security? And then the conversation follows and you gather data. And when you hear something, you write it into the right quadrant of the software security framework. So this model that I'm going to describe is driven by the data. Got the data first, then we built a model. We didn't build a model and try to cram the data into it to justify our views or our own way. In fact, there were a couple things that surprised me about the data that we gathered. Here's number one. I believed, going into this study, that we would have to end up with two models, one for the ISVs and one for the financial services guys, and that those businesses were so diverse that surely they didn't approach software security the same way. Guess what? I was wrong. It turns out that the way Microsoft does code review is very similar to the way, say, well, I can't name the, these one guys. The, this unnamed financial services firm does it. And it's, I mean, the results are in the same format. They use similar tools. It's a very, very interesting thing. Uh, and, and this is good because this means that we can draw some general activities out of software security that work for everybody. And I wasn't sure we were going to get that when we, when we went out to get the data. So we ended up with 110 activities that we identified that are divided into this framework. And I'll tell you uh, more about those in, in just a moment. But the notion was, once again, gather the data, build a model out of the data. And every step of the way, there were three interviewees, Sammy and myself and Brian. And we all went and participated in the same interview. I did all the question asking and guiding of the conversation. But later when we went to talk about the data, we would have big arguments over what we heard. And uh, there were some interesting phenomenon, like my friend Sammy, he has a photographic memory. And he's like a recorder. He remembers everything that everybody said. So Brian and I would be having an argument about interpretation of a certain thing that we thought we heard. And Sammy would always say, well, what that guy actually said was, and I quote, blah, 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 blah. And we'd be, oh, great. You know? But the good thing about these points of view and something that we're preserving in the model to this day is if you have separate points of view and you build your results and then you combine them or you share them or you argue about them, it really makes you think carefully um, about your data. And we have to come to terms. So when we go and we do these interviews, we don't just by caveat um, roughshod score people. We have a huge knockdown drag out fight over whether they should get credit for this or how that, how that should be interpreted. And that's why um, what we're doing is um, science E. It's as science E as say, Anthropology is science. And in fact, we joke around as computer scientists, and we call this our anthropology experiment. So uh, let me show you the framework. Here's the framework. Um, you can see that there are 12 practices in the bottom square there, strategy and metrics, compliance and policy, and so on. Those are divided into four large domains. The domains have uh, names like governance, but let me tell you what they stand for. So governance is about um, running from a management perspective a large-scale initiative. And that involves a set of practices, strategy and metrics practices, compliance and policy practices, and training or staff development practices. Um, intelligence is about stuff you need to carry out software security, like 
if you're going to do static analysis with a static analysis tool, look